ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي اسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام الى المسجد الاقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من اياتنا انه هو السميع البصير واتينا موسى الكتاب وجعلناه هدى لبني اسرائيل الا تتخذوا Ascended his servant, his Abd. Layla min al Masjid al Haram ila al Masjid al 
Al-Aqsa, from Masjid Al-Haram ila Masjid Al-Aqsa to Masjid Al-Aqsa, for what reason? لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَةِ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ الْأَقْصَى الَّذِي بَلَعَقْنَا حَوْلَهُ The Aqsa that is blessed all around it. There's blessings. So many graves of the Prophets are there. So much history is there. And so on and so forth. لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَةِ So that we will show him of our ayat. Now what are these ayat? I will explain to you. لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ now, this name of Allah, inna huwa samir al-basir, is very important here. Because it means Allah is responding to something. It means that Allah is listening and seeing. Number one, the situation of the Prophet. Because, you know, as far as the worldly matters were concerned, the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ had come to a complete halt. And he had not only been da'wah in Mecca now, but he looked for an alternate base, you can say in Ta'if, that also didn't work out. So, and then this was also the time just uh, before where Khadija anha had passed away. Abu Talib had passed away. He was under as a, as a halif, as protect, as a, somebody under the protection of one of the mushrikeen. So this was a very difficult time for the Prophet ﷺ when this event of the Mi'raj happened. Now, compare this with the, the, the Mi'raj of the Prophet. Over here is, لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا so we will show him of our ayat. Now in, in Surah Al-Mi'raj it says, what? And they were going to act as a miracle that as human knowledge increased, 
As human knowledge increased and awareness of the world increased, it would coincide and be congruent with the Quran and this would become a big bayinat, a big sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before this, humanity could not, was not mature enough to consider the things like stars and moon and trees as miracles per se. They weren't mature enough to consider because they were, human being was very much part of nature. It's like if you're inside the box, you can't think outside the box. Only human consciousness reached a certain point where even though human being is still part of nature, but his consciousness, his understanding was kind of, a bit, had the ability to now think and see beyond the natural, the natural environment. So before a prophet is saying a, a, a camel will come out of the mountain, you have to believe in it. So this is a sign for them. Why? This is a big deal. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted that here is my book and now you look at the world. Right? Because whenever you read the Quran, Quran takes you back to the creation. Right? The whole word, word ayah itself is taking you back to Allah's creation, to history and to the creation of Allah. His small but very beautiful book uh, uh, you know, he uses very beautiful terminology. One is, Allah reminds people by history, what is happening by history. The other is, or uh, I think he says, meaning Allah does taskid by showing his signs and his power and his creation and so on and so forth. The point being that with the Prophet, the law came to complete. After that, you're given a book, right? Uh, like Allah subhanahu wa also says in Surah Al-Bayyana. لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُفَّكِينَ حَتَّى تَأْتِيَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَةِ What is the bayina? رَسُولٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ يَذْلُ سُحُفَ مُتَحْفَرَ Okay. فِيهَا كُتُبٌ It's so good. فِيهَا The ha is the bayinat. The ha, the dhameer, is going to the bayinat. And فِيهَا كُتُبٌ Kutub here means the laws. In this kitab is the law, and in this book it's also the bayinat. This is also clear in the book, the ayat of Ramadan. Shah Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفقر. Right? So uh, I hope I read the ayah right. Okay. So uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has two purposes for prophet. The other way to look at the same issue is Bashira wa Nabi. Bishara is for the hereafter. Anzar, generally the Mufassirin have taken Anzar to mean the Anzar of the, the hellfire. But actually a proper and a deeper study and a more proper opinion is Anzar is from dunya. Ya yuhal mudassir. This is now the second revelation being given. Ya yuhal mudassir. Qum fa anzir. Warn the criminals of the world and the people that are causing the facade of the world that they should behave well otherwise consequences of the punishment of her. So, Anzar is more emphasized in Quran in the sense the Quran wants to correct a person's inappropriate behavior. So, Ya yuhal mudassir, Ya yuhal mudassir, Qum fa'anzir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thayadaka fa'tahir, and so on and so forth. Why is this all related to this? Because Mi'raj, that event, that was being mocked at, if you read the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ in the time of the Prophet, when the Prophet mentioned this event. You know, Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl, they became so happy to hear this. They were excited to hear this. It's like if you hear someone in America saying, I'm a terrorist and I'm proud to be terrorist and I want to go on TV and announce it, and you will get all the TV channels just around you. Okay? Because this is such a big treat for them. Right? It's going to increase the ratings of the status quo in every way. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Look, I went to the sky, and I went to Jerusalem, and I went to the sky, and I saw this and this and this. And it sounded much like a fantasy, you know, some, some, some fantasy that anybody would be having. And so, they, the, the Quraysh, when they heard this from the Prophet, they said, shouldn't we bring in a crowd for you to tell them this event? I mean, and the Prophet said, of course, and the Prophet's looking for da'wah. 
And so there's some people with their hands on their head, and there's some people with their hands on their mouth, and some people are listening to what the Prophet is saying, and they're in complete amazement about everything that he's describing. <coughs> but today, as human beings increase in their knowledge, see these things that looked like fantasies back then now become a very big possibility. Einstein, he discussed the idea that if you go one-tenth of the speed of light, time will stop. If you go what? One-tenth of the speed of light, time will stop. I'll give you an example. You're going 60 miles an hour. In one minute, you complete how much? One mile. Double your speed, so then it'll be in 30 seconds. Double your speed, it'll be in? 15 seconds. Double your speed. Seven seconds. Double your speeds. Three and a half. Double, 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 double. It goes back to basically zero. And the Prophet ﷺ, to make this clear, the Prophet even mentioned that he wasn't on just anything. He was traveling on what? Not on bark. Not on lightning, but burak. Many lights. Not one light. He was on many lights. Barak is the plural of Barak, thunder. So he was on an animal that went at this, and even the Prophet in the very famous the hadith, the most proper hadith in the hadith literature about Mi'raj is by a Sahabi named Sa'sa. Sa'sa, radiallahu anhu. He's the one who's most well known to narrate the entire saying of the Prophet because it's very long. And you know, to, to have a hadith that long is one of the is a rare thing. So Zaqsa radiallahu anh, he has the hadith on this where he describes the whole event. You all have heard these events that he went to the first guy and then they asked him and second and third. So I, I'm leaving that out because you already heard that. I want to talk about other things that go around that. So Zaqsa radiallahu anh, he says, the Prophet said وسلم, that when he was on this animal, basically a horse with wings of some sort. So this animal had wings, meaning he was angelic, a part of him, a part of this animal had angelic elements and he was a horse so it had earthly elements too so it was a combination of these and so uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that wherever my gaze would go he would be going at the speed of my gaze meaning he would be at the speed of going at the speed of your gaze is basically the speed of light you see it at night time you see the stars and you're from here to that star that's many millions of light years so the Prophet said, as far as my gaze would go, his speed would be in the gaze of my sight. So these things that were laughable at the time of the Prophet because they had other miracles to look at. The Prophet himself was there. Rasulun min Allah The Ijaz of Qur'an. And these were things that they were able to appreciate. Today, we're able to appreciate another aspect of the Qur'an, another aspect of the miracle of Qur'an. So this is just a side point that I wanted to make clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the Prophet on Burak. Burak was an animal that was going at lightning speeds and scientifically Einstein would agree and a lot of others would agree that if you are possibly able to go at the speed of light, time would stop. I don't know if anyone else has heard about Einstein's paradox theory of the paradox or the, par the, the theory of the twins. Basically Einstein's theory is that if they're two brothers and they're twins and they're 20 years old and one goes in a spaceship at the speed of huh, light and this one lives on earth till he's 60, 70 years old when this one will come back the one that's going at the speed of light he will still be 20 years old because he stopped his time by going at that speed his time had stopped as we discussed mathematically his time had stopped. He was going at the speed of light. He still, time didn't increase for him. But the man who was living on earth, his time has not stopped. His time is still continuing. And this is a phenomenon that's very well known with people that work on satellite GPS and so on and so forth because the GPS timing always turns, goes behind the earth time. It always falls behind. So you have to always adjust the GPS timings. Even air, uh, the, the planes, they will fall, the ones that are super, supersonic planes, they will fall a few seconds, milliseconds behind the atomic clock because of they're going faster and faster. So there is something about going fast 
and the, uh, the, the, the decreasing of the speed of time. This is like a scientific fact. Okay. And uh, so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet وسلم, about this Isra and about when this occurred. So the Prophet وسلم, he is, you can say, disheartened that people have not responded to his da'wah, they have not responded to his call, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, so in that time where this happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Prophet وسلم, to a journey. Now what is the pur purpose of this journey? لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا So we will show him our ayat, we will show him our signs. Now I have to go very quickly to the next passage because the Quran is all interlinked. The Quran is all what? Every, it's, 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 the, the Quran is the most coherent book in the world. But you just have to dig a little bit to see how it is interconnected. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Look, Subhanallah Asra bi Abdihi, Allah is the one who took up his servant, Layla min al Masjid al Haram ila al Masjid al Aqsa, at the night time, from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa, Allahi barak nahmila. So there is a lot of barakah all around this area. This place is a place of barakah. Now, I'm going to give you the answer first, and then I will give you an explanation, or the conclusion I'm going to give to you first. In this moment of being just heard, the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Prophet to this first journey, the first journey, which is the Isra, the land journey, was to show the Prophet وسلم, the final result, the final triumph, the final victory of where in the map of the world it will be that the Muslims will have their final victory and their final triumph. Okay, this, I've given you the conclusion, now I will go into the how and why, in the details. So, the Prophet was disheartened, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, let me take my abd, my servant, and show him what his ummah is going to do, and what his ummah will be able to accomplish, and then, then the mi'raj was for what? The purpose of the mi'raj was to make clear to what are those things and qualities that we should either be away from or towards to reach that goal. For example, this is the very same subject. Remember there are two ayats that were given to the Prophet. This is an ayah about the Isra and then the other one about Mi'raj. But when the Prophet was with Allah, he got how many ayahs? Two ayahs. What is the theme of those ayahs? Okay. What will happen in the future? 
you know, the end of times, if you read the Christian's version of end of times, it's far worse than ours, if you want to look at it even from the negative perspective. And the Jewish idea of the end of times is far worse than ours also. Okay? So this, you know, the hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, the one that they take, they say, Oh, Abdullah, come here, there's a Jew behind the tree, kill him. I don't know if you heard these things on TV and every now and then, you know, oh, Muslims believe that this will happen. Well, the answer to this is one sheikh in, in Saudi Arabia, he gave a very good answer to all of this. Okay? This is one of the greatest scholars Arabia has produced in this century. Some people have called him the Imam Ibn Taymiyyah of this century. Just to give you an idea. And this is Sheikh Safar Hawad. He was put in prison in Saudi Arabia for many years and so on and so forth. He wrote a book. Wa'adul Haq Wa'adul The true promise and the false promise. He says, okay. It's, this should be our attitude exactly what he said. Look, there's a true promise and there's a false promise. Let's see which promise will come true. You have a certain idea of the end of times will be like this. You know, the Christians have an idea of the end of times will be like this. So okay, no problem. Let's see which of the end of times really happens. Which of the end results comes about to be true. And this is, and you know, in the Islamic version, the Christians, they also become, in the, in the, the Sunnah of the Prophet said, the Christians would also become Muslims. So the whole world will basically, the majority of the world will become Muslim. Anyway, coming back to these ayat, so, so this is about the land journey. The purpose of the land journey is, as you will be, it will become clear from the passage again, that, look, the battle lines have been drawn. You, O Muhammad sallallahu you don't have to worry. Your ummah will rise up. And this moment of grief and disappointment, don't let it dishearten you. But there will be other days and better days. Now, this is the, you can say, the Prophet sallallahu has been told this will happen. And our answer to the world is, well, if, it'll, if it's true, it will happen. And if it's true, then it's good for us, right? So, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآذِنَ مُسَى kitab." And over here, the point that is being mentioned in these ayat, these two ayat, before the, the main points start coming in. I will just translate first. وَآذِنَ مُسَى kitab," And we gave Musa alayhi salam, the Islam, the book. وَجَعَلْنَا هُدَى لِبَنِي Israel, And we made this book the guidance for Bani Israel. Why? Because Bani Israel was looking for guidance here and there because of the, the certain situations that occurred. I will make that clear in a second. Don't take anyone as your wakil, as your judge, as your wali, as your helper other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the helper of your ummah. He is the helper of your people. And then Allah says, ذُرِّيَةَ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَنُّهُ And when Nuh was on that boat, what was his wish at that time. You know, these people that didn't believe him for 900 years, now he was hoping he's on that boat, that now he will come to a place and there will be a land of Muslims and there will be an Islamic environment, people that are up the Allah. He had these hopes. He was also a slave of ours that was Abdan Shakura. He was very, he had great gratitude towards Allah. Now, this. وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرْتَيْنِ وَلَتَعْلُنَّ عُمُّ الْكَبِرُ We had written down, we made a command to Bani Israel, to the Jewish community, you will cause fasad in the world, how many times? لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرْتَيْنِ You will cause fasad in the world two times. Now last time, in my last lecture, I discussed the difference between fasad and fitna. If you remember. So over here I just want to mention, highlight the fact the word fasad is used, not fitna is used. Now over here, very quickly, just a view, a very interesting view of the history of Bani Israel. Because the Prophet said, and what is being said here? I only want to point to one thing because I don't want to go through the whole history of Bani Israel and the whole history of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu I only want to point to one thing that's here. And that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, All those things will come to my Ummah that came to Bani Israel like two shoes of a hair. Even if you compare our histories, they're similar. In the history of Bani Israel, Aqsa was dropped Twice. Aqsa was 
Aqsa, their, 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 the, the Masjid Aqsa was dropped how many times? Twice. This is being mentioned. The similarities between us and them historically is so much, just to give you an example, that the Assyrians came from the north for them, the Crusades came from the north for us. The Babylonians came from the east for them, the Tatars came from the east for us. Like, I'm not going into the history, I only want to stick with the text for now. So Allah says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَهُ لَهُمَا What wa'ad? Wa'ad? What wa'ad? Wa'ad here it is referring to, if you disobey, if you don't take Allah as your wakil, then this will happen. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدُهُ لَهُمَا When the first of that time will happen, that you will cause what in the world? Fasad in the world. Then we will do this to you. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدُهُ لَهُمَا بَعَثْنَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِبَادًا لَنَا Now those people who are the disbelievers, the disbelievers, they're called إِبَادًا لَنَا here. Because the disbelievers are doing the work of Allah, which is punishing the Ummah, the former Muslim Ummah, which is Bani Israel in this case. Ibad al lana is being used for the non-Muslims, I want this to be clear. So the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدُ When the first of the promises comes, بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ We will raise upon you, we will raise against you. Ibad al lana أُلِي بَعْسٍ شَدِيدٍ They will be very strong in war. And they will even enter your houses. And this is a promise that is fulfilled. It's done. So Bani Israel had their first rise with Dawood and then Suleiman. And then after that they had their decline. And the decline happened when these armies came and invaded them. Just like we had our first rise. And then the Crusades happened. And then the Tatars came. Same thing. Okay, so this is the first. When the Crusades came, what happened? They took away what? Books. But Aqsa. Because the theme here is Subhanallah Asra bi Abdi Ilayta bin al Masjid al Haram ila Masjid al Aqsa. The rule of the world. This is the key now I'm about to give to you. Historically, this is a fact. Whoever historically ruled Jerusalem ruled the world. And when Isa والسلام, will come back, he will rule from Aqsa. His Dar al Khilafah will be Aqsa. Whoever rules Aqsa rules the world. This is why Aqsa is so important. The issue of power and the issue of being power conscious. This is extremely important, especially in Islam, because Islam says, just like the angel said, are you going to cause? It's our responsibility to not let there be fasad. And in fact, the word taqwa, what does the word taqwa mean? Taqwa is God consciousness of His power. To be conscious that if you don't take the proper action, Allah can take action against your wrong action, whether in this life or the next life. This is taqwa. Taqwa is knowing Allah can take action against your wrong action. This is it. Saving yourself from Allah taking an action against you. This is what? This is the essence of taqwa. Protecting yourself from that point. The point from which Allah then will respond with something either in this life or the next life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking to the Prophet to that area of the world that if you have control of it, you have control of the world. This is the historical reality of that little There is a certain reality behind the effect of which it was, and it's no wonder that it was during the Dar al Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anh that we, we what? Got Aqsa in our hands. So as long as a community has control of Aqsa, they're in control of the world. So this means that there are people, I don't want to go into details, but there are people in the Christian world, in the Jewish world, and unfortunately not in the Muslim world. 
who are very eager to get to that point where Aqsa becomes their central possession. Okay? Anyway, so let us continue. <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, we send our servants, our, we send our servants against you. And these servants are who? Muslims? Huh? Or non-Muslims? We said the non-Muslims, they were Muslims, right? So Allah says, what? Allah says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَاهِمْ The first of those promises come. Which is what? That, what is that? فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَاهُمَا هُمَا is what? لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ هُمَا Right? Twice. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَاهُمَا When the first promise that you will cause facade in the world will happen, then we will send our servants against you. And at that moment, the people who do not believe in Allah hmm, become more beloved to Allah in some ways than the ones who believe in Allah. If they're not doing their responsibility. And if they don't take Allah as their wakil, as their king. And if they don't hold up to the mission. So, then Allah says, ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَا لَكُمْ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَا لَكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ then we again restored you, we gave you strength against the, the, the this, you were, that this was the rise with Uzair alayhi salatu wasalam. Uzair alayhi salatu wasalam, he came and he restored Jerusalem, he restored the Torah and so on and so forth. ثُمَّ لَدَدْنَا لَكُمْ كَرَّتَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَمْدَدْنَاكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِ وَبَلِينَ وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا And we made you so strong and we gave you so many resources and we gave you so many children and power and because you came back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we restored your strength and we restored your honor. And then what? In أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ If you do good, you do good for yourself. And if you do evil, it's for yourself. Meaning it's against you. Meaning the history revolves around your attitude as an ummah to your attitude toward the deen. When the Muslims are good to the deen, then they rise, they have honor. When their attitude is negative to the deen, then they go down. So, وَإِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنْفُسِكُمْ وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدُ الْآخِرَةِ And when the second promise came, which is what? This is now very, very important and very, very interesting, especially in relationship to the two ummas. When Zakaria والسلام, was there, if you remember, it was at the beginning, he was murdered by who? Zakaria alayhi salatu wasalam. Why was he murdered? Yahya alayhi salatu wasalam, why was he murdered? He was murdered because at that time, Bani Israel was being occupied by the Romans. He was being occupied by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire did not like these, the, 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 the Sharia and, and Muslims practicing their deen. And, so they killed Zakaria. They killed Yahya alayhi salatu then they tried to kill after that. Third is Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Again the same situation will happen. The, the Roman Empire will be there. And Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will be coming now. So this similarity is also there. So anyway, Allah says, فَإِذَا جَعْوَ عَدُ الْآخِرَةِ And this is when the people of Bani Israel, they were lost in what at that time historically it's called hedonism. The principle of pleasure. Hedonism is the principle of pleasure. They wanted to live a life of pleasure, forget about their deen, don't worry about the Sabbath. By the way, the Sabbath starts on Friday, but that's a separate issue. Don't worry about the Sabbath, don't worry about the commandments, don't worry. Thus, the, 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 the Muslims of that time, they had gone into the Roman Empire and completely become Roman, you know. And, and so now Isa alayhi was telling them, no, 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 you can't do that. So they tried, Zakaria tried this, Yahya alayhi tried this, then Isa alayhi tried this. And so they tried to kill also Isa alayhi The point being here is that the Muslim Ummah was now again reoccupied by foreign powers and foreign entities. And again here, the power that the Roman Empire had in comparison to what the Bani Israelis had was nothing. There was no ratio of proportion or very little racial proportion between their power. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا جَاءُ وَعَدُ الْآخِرَةِ So in our ummah what happened? Through the Crusades, Aqsa was lost, and then regained through Salahuddin, Ayyubi. Now again a second time will come, 
that Aqsa will be lost because why? Why will it be lost? It will be lost because the Prophet, number one, in some of the ahadith, he's given this ishaq, by the way. The Prophet said in one hadith, the people that die defending Aqsa will be martyrs. So this is one hadith. But more specifically, because the Prophet, all those things will happen to my mama that happened to Bani Israel, number one. And specifically, the things that are being pointed out in the Quran. What is being pointed out in the Quran here is losing Jerusalem, losing Masjid Aqsa. Is being pointed out here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Now this time when they enter, they will enter to humiliate your faces, to disgrace you like we're being today. And they will enter your masjid just like they did the first time. And then in you know in history, this is in 62 AD, I think it is, when the fall of the temple happened, when the it basically came to a complete uh, end. Not even a brick of that Aqsa will remain. Now, this event of the Aqsa falling down and then the Ummah rising up and then the Aqsa falling down, what does this have to do with Mi'raj? What does this have to do with the first time? <coughs> By the way, let me just finish this. Allah is then saying to the Jewish people, look, this is your history. And saying to us, look, this will be your history. Maybe still Allah will still have mercy upon you. Maybe you will be one of those people that are saved. By the way, Sutul Kahf is very important in this relationship. I just want to share with you the other, what is Sutul Kahf saying? And by the way, the translations, they kind of make a mistake. Look at this. Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له There's no Quran, there's no crookedness. It's plain talk and straight talk. And that is why. قَيِّمًا لِيُنذِرَكُمْ لِيُنذِرَ بَأْسًا What's بَأْسًا شَدِيمًا? It's warning you of a terrible war. بَأْس means war. And none of the translations make this clear. There is, you can say, a World War III being declared in the Quran. لِيُنْذِرَكُمْ Huh? Ba's. What is Ba's? Ba's is war. Huh? Hardship and war. More specifically. لِيُنْذِرَكُمْ بَعْسًا شَدِيدًا A very severe and a very hard war that will take place. This again is referring to the, the end. When the end lines, the battlefields are drawn. بَعْسًا شَدِيدًا لِيُنْذِرَكُمْ بَعْسًا شَدِيدًا Right? So, over here, أَسَارَكُمْ أَنْ يَرْحَمَكُمْ إِنْ عُمْتُمْ عُدْنَا وَجَعَلْنَا جَحَنَّمَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ حَسِيرًا إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَحْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَى The Qur'an guides to what is most straight. وَيُبَشِّلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا Now, over here that I want to mention. What is the relationship between mentioning? Why did Allah mention the, the Isra of the Prophet? And then right after that mention the whole history of Bani Israel. The rising and the fall of Bani Israel, losing the Aqsa, Masjid Aqsa twice in Bani Israel. Why did Allah do this? Why? To tell the Prophet وسلم, that, that that will work goes up, that, that will work goes down, the Ummahs go up, the Ummahs go down. But finally, what will happen? Finally, it will be that Islam will be, Islam will see the day. Islam will find itself superior. But yes, sometimes da'wah is hard. Nuh is also mentioned because he did da'wah so much and the Prophet felt like in the position of Nuh that I've done everything for these people. They're not believing me. And so with this now in mind, now go just go over these ayat very quickly and then I will talk about the other aspect, which is Subhanallah asra bi abdihi perfect is the one who took his servant Layla min al Masjid al Harami ila al Masjid al Aqsa he took his servant from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa Alladhi barakna hawlahu this is a very blessed place that people are fighting for it Linuriya hum min ayatina because we will show him our signs our signs for what our signs for the coming events 
are signs for the coming events. What will happen in the world? In Nahu was Samir Nasir, and Allah is listening and He is seeing. Wa Musa, and now Allah is saying, Look at the people before they went through this thing. So Wa Ataina Musa Kitaba wa Jalna Huda Libani Israel, Allah Tatakibu Minduni Wakila. Look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm your wakil, I'm your I'm your judge. Don't take anyone other than me as your judge. Then this was the dua of Muhammad when he was carrying them in his progeny that these would be the people that would come after me and they would be given the book and they would be given the sharia and they would live by it and then Allah said and we made it a command for Bani Israel that or we made it meaning it's not that Allah wants them to do it but in the sense that it would happen you can read this ayah today as you also twice would need almost like lose your Islam if you read about what happened during the times of the Tatars and if you read about what's happening in today's time and what was happening to Bani Israel back then. The Jewish history, history of the Jews, it's fascinating. Fascinating history. If you read what happened with the historic, historically, what happened with the Jewish people, it's very, very fascinating. But again, only the last point I want to mention here again. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions their history very quickly. Be just in an arrogant situation. When you, the first of those times that you're doing facade in the world will happen, you, the Ummah that has to show the people the way, that has to be the lighthouse of the way, you, when you start doing facade, then what happens? Then we send our servants against you. Even if they are non Muslims, the Assyrians in this case, and the Babylonians, even if they're non Muslims, Allah is calling them. Huh? And what will be their quality? Uli ba'sin shadid. They will have great military power. Uli ba'sin shadid. Fajazu khilal al I want to remind you that if you compare what uh, Changiz Khan did to the Muslims, to what happened to Bani Israel, it's very similar. You know Changiz Khan, you know the Eid, it was in, in Farsi because the, the, in Farsi they call it Eid Gah. You know what Eid Gah is? The place where they have the Eid prayers. He gathered, Jinggiz Khan gathered all the Muslims in the, in the Eid prayer place. And he asked the Muslims, he said, do you know why I'm here? Why am I here? Well, obviously Muslims don't have any answer. I'm here, I'm here as a punishment of God to you people. I'm here as a punishment from God to you people. These are his words in history. And so, in the situation, the Muslims at that time, just so I, you have a clear picture, I'm sure many of you have read this in history, it was a time where if a female Mongol lady said to a Muslim man, stand right here, I'm going to bring a sword to cut your neck, he would not move from his place. This is what happened to the Muslims when the Tatars were. What we're suffering today is not much different from that the same or even that was maybe more severe but the point is that this happens this happened with Ummah Muhammad وسلم, and the same thing happened with the Ummah of Musa وسلم, before that what happened is they left the deen when they left the deen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is why look the very famous hadith when the Prophet said your value will be like the uh, the, the, the water uh, fog you know, the, the, the what is that thing in the, 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 the scum of the... Yes, the mist you can say. What is being mentioned is mentioned, uh, you know, hubbu dunya wa karahiyatun. No, it's the struggle, the willing to struggle and to value for your values and your morals and your Islam. And you won't have that. And what in another hadith the Prophet said, and Allah will put, take out the fear of you from your... Your enemies will no longer fear you. So here again, Bani Israel, they were there in Ummah, they had the Book of Allah, but their enemies didn't fear them, they took over them. And those people that took over them, Allah is calling them, لَنَا أُلِي بَعْسٍ شَدِيدٍ فَجَاسُ خِلَالَ They even entered into your houses. 
وَكَانَ وَعْدًا مَفْعُولًا And this was a promise already done. This has been done. This was to be done. ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَا لَكُمْ But then you did tawbah, you turned back to Allah. ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَا لَكُمْ كَرَّتَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَمْدَدْنَا لَكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِ وَبَنِينَ وَأَجْعَلْنَا لَكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا Then the second time in history, so Uzair a.s. came and he rose up. In our case, we had the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire came through the Mongols and then we had the Ottoman Empire. And then we rose up again. And then what? Then after that, when the second time came, then there was a great humiliation and dishonor and disgrace that was done against you. Then your enemies entered the Aqsa, the masjid that is being referred here, like they did the first time. Okay. So the purpose of the Isra was to show the Prophet ﷺ, of course, that that area from where the globalization of Islam will start. That area from where? Islam will then begin to occupy and have influence over the globe, that area. So Aqsa is the place if you have control of, you have control of the world, you can influence the world and so on and so forth. And so this is something Muslims need to be cognizant of. And by the way, since this is being recorded, the message to the Palestinian brothers is, don't make Palestine an issue about Palestine. Make the issue of Palestine about Muslim Aqsa. Yes. Okay. Then the Mi'raj. Now the Mi'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet, don't worry, your Ummah will be a great Ummah. Your Ummah will occupy all the corners of the world. And so the Prophet sallallahu is being given a pat on the back, you can say, he's giving an encouragement that this is the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things go up, things go down. You know, There's night and then there's day also. So this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, now, coming to the mi'raj. Now this is very interesting. And this is... So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, by the way, this part of the Quran, Surah Al-Najm. Now Surah Al-Najm has to do with the pagans. And Surah Bani Israel, as I mentioned, has to do with Bani Israel. And as I mentioned before, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet said that there will be two groups that will be entering into Jannah. The first group is the one that fights against India, and the second group is the one that will be fighting against the Jannah. I want to give you some details of this, more details at another time when I have more space to talk. And that is, with the role of Mahdi, this also should be clarified here, because I will be talking. The main role of Mahdi, will be the Prophet ﷺ, he has been sent. If you in fact pick up Sahih Bukhari and where you pick up the, 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 the description of Mahdi and one of the narrations in there is very interesting and that is this I'm going to explain to you. Imam Muslim he seems to be putting these two things together and he's correct. And that is the purpose of prophethood is what? This is the hadith mentioned in let me tell you the hadith very quickly, Aisha Allah The Prophet said something that you know Islam will have a decline. And Aisha Allah says, how is that possible? That Islam will have a decline. And then she reads the ayah, وَالَّذِي أَصَّلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَىٰ وَالدِّينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَىٰ الدِّينِ كُلِّ Allah sent His Messenger and His Deen al to make it prevail. And then the Prophet said, well this is in the, when, in the end. This is in the chapter of the Mahdi of Imam Muslim. This hadith is there, out of, almost seemingly out of context. But if you also look at majority of the Mufassirin, they have quoted this ayah, in reference to the coming down of Isa alayhi also. But I'm not going into this issue. What I want to mention is, the role of Mahdi should be clear, simply very simple. The Prophet sallallahu has passed meaning he's gone to the next world. And there had to be somebody from his family who witnesses, somebody from the family of the Prophet who is guided, who is what? 
He's guided human being who owns the mission of the Prophet. He what? He belongs to the, he's from the family of the Prophet and he owns the mission of the Prophet He's in the mission of the Prophet He's from the family of the Prophet who witnesses on behalf of the Prophet as on behalf of the Prophet being his family member that this job has been completed for which the Prophet was sent. If you read the ahadith, the role of the Mahdi basically ends up to a certain point, up to the military expeditions, you'll find the, the role of the Mahdi. But after that, you only find the role of, when you bring up all the ahadith, you only find the role of Isa alayhi salatu wasallam. For he will get married, he will rule the Muslim world for 40 years. It's, the role of the Mahdi comes to a complete end. The other thing you'll find very interesting is that when Isa salam comes down and after a few wars that they'll have, the Mahdi will take an army to India and China to fight there. And Isa salam will take the army to Israel to fight there. So there will be one army that will be fighting in Hind. This is because these borders, I don't know if they'll remain or not. It doesn't, I don't think the world will have the same borders by this time. And that all will happen very soon now. The borders of the world will be very different. I can prove to you. Look, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ahlullah will walk from Iraq to Mecca to meet the Mahdi. Right? How can this happen if there's visas required? No, it can't. Uh, this, the people will walk from Syria to Mecca. How can you be walking? There will, there will, because the, the, the resources of the world will not be the same, the borders won't be the same. There will be fawda, anarchy, anarchy. This thing that's in Iraq is going to, this is the place of the fitna, as you know the Prophet said. And from here the fitna is going to just extend throughout the whole Arab, Arab world. So anyway, coming to the Mi'raj of the Prophet ﷺ, so the Mi'raj now was the spiritual ascension the Prophet ﷺ had himself, meaning when I say spiritual, I don't mean with the ruh, without the body. I don't mean that. I mean with he went himself. Okay? But it was the other side. This is the goal. The goal is what? Or what will happen? This is the wa'ad of Allah. That will happen that the Muslims are going to occupy the world. Oh Prophet, don't worry. Your da'wah will be very successful. But to get there, the people that are with you, the people that are in your mission, they need some help. They need some help and they need some guidance. So when the Prophet ﷺ was taken on this journey, he was then shown aspects of his ummah that will cause trouble to this ummah and aspects of this ummah that will show bisharat. You can say good news to this ummah. Mostly, you can say all the warnings were given. Don't deal in interest. You know, don't so on and so forth. Don't uh, don't uh, don't uh, cheat on your wife or wives and so on and so forth. So all these things were explained in the Mi'raj of the Prophet One thing that before I forget, because it's a very important sunnah, and especially what is happening nowadays, I don't have to go into, I don't want, I can't go into too much detail, but one of the most interesting things that are not talked about, but the Prophet made this statement when he went to Mi'raj. The Prophet was told in Mi'raj that the hijab, who knows what's hijab? Hijama. Hijama is the bloodletting sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, which is almost dead. And it is such an important sunnah that imagine this, the Israeli army does blood hijama. The Israeli army does hijama every six months. I don't know, you've spent time in Saudi Arabia. Have you ever seen people take blood out from the back? In, in here also does people, and in even Mecca, many people go for the Hajj. They take the blood out from the back. Yeah, they take the dirty blood out. Right. That's what they say. No, and I, Wallahi, I can tell you, I have shown this to doctors. I've done this in front of doctors. I just, in fact, recently did one. Doctors are completely confused. I wish Brother Nassim was here himself, he would tell you. Uh, doctors themselves will tell you that there's something about this. Wallahi, I'm telling you the truth. There's a doctor uh, in, not far from here. He was not, he was not able to move. Not able to move. Very hard time. He's a doctor. He's an internist. Okay? Not able to move, not able to function. And uh, he didn't even believe in, you know, magic and na'aheem. And okay, fine, there's no problem. But, you know, his wife pushed him. You know, you know Sheikh Omar, maybe he can, you know, so they came to me. And I said, why don't we try? So I, one of the things I said, let's do hijab. Let's do the blood play. 
And uh, so he did the bloodletting. Wallahi, I have the text messages to show because I can keep him anonymous, but I can show you the text messages. He was able to function as a doctor. He did not lose any energy. He said just a little bit of energy he still loses, but he's like almost like 100% functional compared to where he was. The hijama removes cholesterol, removes diabetes, removes, uh, if you have magic, it removes magic. And the Prophet as much as he said to do it, it's almost like the whole Muslim world doesn't know about it. I mean, now, alhamdulillah, there's some revival and some understanding is coming back. But this act of taking out the blood, it doesn't have to be from the back. It can be from wherever you have pain or it can be anywhere. Chinese people do this too, by the way. Chinese people also do bloodletting and they also do bloodletting in the hospitals. Because I've had these discussions with doctors and I've been trying to understand why this works scientifically. But uh, and letting out the blood, the reason I'm mentioning this is because we live in that time where it's very important to do this. It's very important to do this in this time in particular because of the level of the fitness and the, the, the parasitical food that we eat, the inorganic food that we eat, and all these types of artificial foods that we eat. So we're, we're prone to a lot of diseases and so on and so forth. So hijama will allow a lot of that poison, you can say, to come out of your body. Okay. And I, have, you know, I, I, I can tell you I've seen so many benefits come out of hijama. Uh, that uh, that uh, I can tell you, like my own personal experience, that when I, I do it every six months. The reason I do it every six months, you don't have to do it every six months, but a lot of people do it every six months or at some interval, but I do it especially because I help people in certain cases that can be contagious, so I do it myself. But I will tell you this, that when I did hijama, I did the bloodletting, uh, the one thing that I did notice is that it ma made me more energetic, and it made me more, uh, more energetic, less lazy, and so on and so forth. So it has this ability to take out some of the negativity, the negative blood. It doesn't even come out as blood, to tell you the truth. The part, have you seen what comes out? Yes. It's really, really just... I've shown, it to doc, I've shown it to doctors, and they're like, they don't understand what comes out. It's like not even... It's like, even though it's in a vacuum, it's in a vacuum, so the, when it's, the blood's in a vacuum, it doesn't clogulate, it doesn't congeal. But it congeals, and it becomes like meat. Literally, like meat. I don't know what you saw, but uh, you saw this meat thing? Yeah. It, like yeah. the, the, the group I went for. The and it was black? He offered every single person before you move, like you should do this. Oh, okay, 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 mashallah. That's how I, I come across this. Oh, okay, okay, mashallah, mashallah, yes. So, one of the things that are not mentioned about Miraj is the Prophet ﷺ, he did mention to do hijama. And this is one of the great sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, it has a lot of benefits from what I've seen and it needs to be further and you know I wish brother Chaudhary was here because I need to tell him there needs to be research on this Somebody needs to write in journals about this. Same thing like Miswak. Alhamdulillah there are a few now articles that have come about the Miswak and you know authentic journals that doctors would read and you know so on and so forth and so there's some journals so some work is being done as far as Miswak is concerned but hijama is another thing that some work should be done, some studies should be done, something should be published for the world to know. And you know, this is, we're not the only people that do it. The Chinese people, like I said, they do it and so on and so forth. So, and the Prophet ﷺ used to do hijama on himself and he, 